Hey guys, I hope y'all are having a good day today. Today we're going to be talking about lesson 7.2, which we see here, the title of this lesson is the natural base E. And so we're going to be talking about E today. So what is the natural base E? So E is a number. It is very similar to pi. It is a constant. There is a set value for E. E represents a specific number, a specific value. Much like pi that y'all are very familiar with, you know that pi is an irrational number, 3.14159 dot, 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 goes on forever, never repeats, never ends. It's the definition of irrational. E is very much like that. It is a set fixed amount. Um, it's a little bit more than 2.7, uh, 2.718, and then it goes on forever, never, doesn't repeat, doesn't, uh, um, doesn't end, it goes on forever. It's an irrational number. So it's a little bit more than 2.7, kind of like pi is a little bit more than 3.14, um, but it has a, you know, it has a set specific value that never changes. So the first thing you have to remember is that E is not a variable. It is a constant. It is a fixed amount. So E is a number that was uh, discovered, and I say discovered, not created, because E is a naturally occurring number. It's a number that has always existed out in, in the relative of mathematics. It's always existed, it's always been out there, but Euler was the one that discovered it and pinned it down to the value that we know of it today. Um, since his time uh, using computers and whatnot, we have calculated E out to, you know, many, million, many, many millions of places, um, just like we have pi, but he was the one that nailed it down and, and, and specified this value for us. Um, it is a very important value, even though you've never heard of it, uh, probably up until now, you may have seen an E button on a calculator, um, but you really didn't know what it was or what it represented. Uh, it is very important. It is considered to be right up there alongside pi and I, the irrational unit that we learned about earlier this year, and zero and one. Um, e is kind of in that, that pantheon of really important numbers. And so uh, it was discovered by a Swiss mathematician back in the 1700s, a guy by the name of Leonard Euler. This isn't going to be on the test, but as advanced pre-AP honors GT kind of students, that's something that, that you ought to be a little bit familiar with. You ought to know about uh, this mathematician. He was very important. He was considered one of the greatest, if not considered the greatest mathematician of his time. Um, and he made a lot of contributions in mathematics and science and other areas as well. Uh, he was a uh, very important uh, figure uh, for mathematics and certainly in his time. And he's the one that nailed down E for us. And it was uh, uh, sometimes we just refer to it as E. Sometimes people call it the natural base or the natural base E. Sometimes people refer to it as Euler's number after uh, the mathematician Leonard Euler who uh, helped discover this number. So people always ask, you know, what is this number? It is a naturally occurring number. We, we say that Euler discovered it, not that he created it. It always existed, this relationship of this value of E has always existed. It's just kind of like pi. It took some time to figure it out and figure out its relationship to um, other, other things that uh, existed out there. So this is the expression that we use to kind of calculate. When we start calculating E out to a number of places, it's this expression 1 plus 1 over x to the power of x. I'm not going to go into why this expression and everything. Um, some of, uh, you know, this, this E has a lot of uh, 
importance when we start talking about compound interest, which we talked about in lesson 7.1, um, about the sum of infinite series, about measuring space underneath a curve, which is what we're doing in calculus. Um, and so we're not there yet for all of those things. And it is very important with logarithms, which we are going to get into in the next lesson in 7.3. So for now, you're going to have to just kind of accept that, hey, this value is very important. This is the way we calculate it. And this is, I'm showing you this, because again, as advanced mathematics students, you ought to have an understanding of where we get some of these things. They are not um, just magical numbers we plucked out of the air. They're calculated um, using specific formulas and trying to find out specific values. And you will understand more about E uh, once you get to calculus. Um, and you'll understand a little bit more about it even after we get through lesson 7.3 and we start learning about logarithms. Uh, this is E on a graph as we start to calculate this expression 1 plus 1 over x all to the power of x. As we um, start calculating uh, here and we start you know, plugging in values for x like 10 and then 100, you know, 10 squared is 100, 10 cubed is 1,000, 10 to the fourth power is of course 10,000 and so on. When we get up to a million, 100 million, and eventually all the way down to billions and so forth, we start to see the output of this expression right here. And the output you see with uh, plugging in 10 for X, it's uh, almost 2.6, plugging in 100, we're already at 2.7. Uh, Plugging in a thousand, we're at 2.7169, which is almost 2.717. Now we're at 2.718, 2.718, 2.718, and we're getting very close to the value, um, you know, or at least the approximation of the value of E that uh, we use today. So the 2.71828. Um, becomes, you know, at least to five de uh, decimal places becomes the value that we tend to use. Uh, in graphing calculators, E is often programmed just like pi is to a number of places, so it can make very accurate calculations. So, you know, one of the things for you to remember is, hey, it's a little bit more than 2.7. 2.71828 8 is a good uh, kind of memory point to uh, at least no e to that many places. You see here on the graph that using this expression, e comes up, or this uh, curve rather, comes up and is approaching what we know is the value of e, this 2.71828, 1828, dot, 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 goes on out forever and ever. And you see that it, uh, this curve, the blue curve, and the, the red dotted line, which represents the value of E, starts closing in on each other. It's creating, a, of course, an asymptote there. And as this curve gets close to that line, um, it's getting very, very close, getting that really, really closeness that uh, we have with curves and asymptotes and uh, creating this value. And as you go on out, you're never gonna quite get to the value, of course, and that's how we keep calculating E to more and more places. So the natural base E, and you see sometimes uh, people do get a little hung up here. We see the 2.7 and you see the 182818828. Two and sometimes people start to think, ooh, this 1828.1828, two that's a repeating pattern. But then it doesn't repeat after that. Then it's four, six, and then it keeps changing. But it makes it pretty easy to remember E to a number of decimal places because you get the 2.7 and then 1828.1828. Well, now you've gone out to this many decimal places here. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine decimal places that you've got E down to without much uh, memorization. It's pretty easy to recall that much. 
So you can recall a pretty accurate version of E if you're ever having to just punch it into a maybe a more simplified calculator. You know, 2.7, 1828, 1828. Okay, now you've got a pretty, pretty accurate approximation to use with E. Okay, so that is the value E. That's the number. So remember that it is a constant, it's not a variable, it doesn't change. Its value is already preset. It is a little bit more than 2.7. That 2.7182818281828 dot 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 goes on forever. Doesn't repeat after that, um, but uh, we know how much it is. It is a fixed number. It is irrational, and that's about how much it is. So, let's. It's going to be used as a base. Obviously, it's called the natural base e. So let's look at some of the examples. Example one in your book, we have. E being used here, e to the third power times e to the sixth power. So we remember, of course, that e is a fixed number. It's a real number. It's uh, a real irrational number. It's uh, not a variable. But because it's, you know, this is the same base, the rules of exponents applies. When the bases are the same, what do we do with the exponents? We add them. So. We take the two exponents, three and six, we add them together, and of course we get e to the power of nine, okay? So that's how we would simplify an expression like this. Look at the second example here. We've got 16 e to the fifth over four e to the fourth. And so again with these, we would wanna work with um, you know, common terms. So, hey, 16 divided by four, I, I can do that, you know, mathematically, I know that 16 divided by four is four. And then what about e to the fifth over e to the fourth? Well, again, the properties of exponent rules tells us that when we're dividing a common base, we subtract the exponents. So here I would, I've got my 16 divided by four, which is four. I've got my e to the fifth over e to the fourth, which means I'm going to uh, subtract the exponents. Five minus four, of course, it's just one. And so that's four e to the power of one or just four e. Okay. Now I could get a, a numeric approximation for that. Kind of like when I'm multiplying a number times pi. If I need an approximation, if I need to get an actual value that's approximated to a certain number of decimal places, I can, but the best way to leave an answer like this is for E, unless I am specifically asked to, you know, come up with an approximate value, um, then I would say, okay, I know E is 2.7182818246, I'm going to multiply it by four, you know, and I'll get an approximation. But unless I'm asked for that, I'm going to leave this answer just like this for E. And same thing, we, we do this with pi all the time in geometry. And you'll do it again in trig uh, when you get to pre-cal next year. Then we just leave things in terms of pi. We also want to leave things in terms of E whenever possible because it is the most accurate, the most uh, correct answer. One other example here. So this one, you know, we have some values in the parentheses being raised to an exponent, being raised to the power of two. So there are two bases here. There's three being raised to the power of two, and there's e to the power of negative four x being raised to the power of two. So what I want to do, I want to separate these out. I want to raise both bases to the power of two. So three gets raised to the power of two. The e gets raised to the power of two. So the three gets raised to the power of two, and we see that right there, three squared, which of course we know is nine. And then here we have e to the power of negative four x being raised to the power of two. So again, we're gonna use our exponent rules. We know that the power of a power property says an exponent raised to an exponent. We multiply them, that makes negative eight. And so I already did my three squared and got my nine. I did my negative four X times two and got negative eight X. Now I'm gonna use the negative exponent properties that we've learned and say, hey, a negative exponent means I take the E, I use its reciprocal, which is gonna be one over E to the power of eight X. And so the nine stays in the numerator. 
nine times the one is nine, and then in the denominator, e to the power of eight x. And I have simplified that expression as far as I can. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about natural base functions. So look at this form. You want to recognize this, y equals a times e to the power of rx. This is what we call a natural base exponential function. So we've got the e, here is the base. We have this a, this number in front of it. You know, you may think of it as a coefficient. It is certainly a multiplier. It's not technically a coefficient because e is not a variable, e is a constant, but it is a multiplier um, in front. And of course, we're following order of operations. We're gonna take the e to the exponent before we multiply it by a. Um, you know, the order that we do the things, we do these things in is important. It is significant mathematically in this case. So this is what we would call a natural base function. So there's a couple of rules to remember when we're working with a natural base function. When the a value is greater than zero, which means it's a positive number. When a is positive and r, the r up here, and the r times x, when the r is also positive, that coefficient of x, when it is positive, then you are looking at an exponential growth function. So both a, and the coefficient of x, when they're both positive, it's an exponential growth function. When a is positive, but the r is negative, in other words, the coefficient of that x up in the exponent area, when it is negative, less than zero, it's negative, then it's gonna be an exponential decay. So growth, a is positive and r is positive. Decay, a is still positive, but the r, the coefficient of x is negative, that's gonna be a decay function. And so again, our book gives us um, a couple of examples to look at. Uh, here's the graphs, I forgot these were here. Um, here's the graph of y equals e to the x. This is the simplest form of a natural base growth function because the a is one and the r is one. So this is the simplest form. And here we see, and we see that when uh, x is one, y is then equal to e. That's the output because e to the power of one is e. So that's the exponential growth natural base function. And here is the e to the power of negative x. Again, this is the most basic form because the a again is a positive one. And then this time, the R, of course, had to be negative to be a decay function, so it's negative one. Um, and we see it's exponential decay here, okay? So these are our exponential growth and our exponential decay functions. When, uh, just like here, we put in one for X and then got E. Here, when we put in one for X, remember the uh, negative exponent causes us to use the reciprocal of the base. And so this becomes one over e to the power of one or just one over e. And one over e comes out to be approximately 0.368. So we see that here on the graph. <clears throat> All right, let's look at a uh, couple of examples. So we're asked to tell whether the function represents exponential growth or exponential decay, and then to graph the function. So as I look at this, again, I wanna identify the A and the R. So my A value is three, it's a positive number. So far, so good. My R up here, there's no number in front of the X, so therefore my R is a positive one. So my A is positive, my R is positive. What does that tell me? Since my A is positive and my R is positive, we know that makes it a exponential growth function, a natural base exponential growth function. <clears throat> In order to graph this, I simply need some points. So I'm going to go and substitute in some values for X. So I'm gonna go and plug in some numbers for X. Remember, we picked the X's 
the equation or the function gives us the output, gives us the y's that go with it. So we're going to pick some numbers. You know, again, I recommend picking some fairly basic numbers, things like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, things like that that we want to substitute in for x. So I'm going to make a table. I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to pick some x values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1. I'm going to substitute them into the equation, and then I'm going to do the calculation. You're probably going to want to use a calculator to do the calculation because we're dealing with decimals, um, you know, numbers that are, that are going on here. So as we plug this in, we get the negative 2. Um, it gives us this output, plug in the negative 1. We get this output, plug in the 0. We get this output, plug in the 1. We get this output. And then we're just going to go graph those points on a coordinate plane. Uh, one thing, folks, I will remind you, um, some of my students have seen that they've lost points on some of their homework papers because they're not drawing accurate graphs. So remember that you know, our graphs have to have an X and a Y axis. We label them. We need to have a scale. We need tick marks or, in this case, the full grid of the graph paper. Um, we need numbers that are signifying what these tick marks or these grid marks are, you know, what their values are, both on the X and on the Y axis, so that I, I know what I'm, how I'm counting here, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so on. I can tell what the values are, and then we label, you know, and mark and indicate and label key points. So these are the kind of things you should be doing on your graphs. Graphs have to tell a story to the person who looks at them. The person who looks at them has to be able to understand things. Okay. Uh, here's a, let's look at a second example. So this one, again, we look at it and we think, okay, A and R. What are the A and the R? So we look at this, and again, the A value, the number in front of E. Uh, is a there's no number there so that means that number is one so that's a positive number so far so good we go up here and we look at the the r and we see it is a negative five tenths negative 0 0.5 negative five tenths so that's a r value that is negative so when a is positive and r is negative we know that's a natural base um, exponential decay function okay Again, um, I want to graph this, so I'm going to make a table. Again, I'm going to substitute in some numbers for x. The equation will give me the y. So this time we're going to use negative 4, negative 2, 0, and 2. We're going to go and substitute those numbers in up here for x and let the equation give us the outputs of the y. And we get the graph that goes along with that there. All right. Finally, one last thing I want to talk to you about. In lesson uh, 7.1, in the previous lesson, we talked about the compound interest formula at the end of the lesson, and we learned the compound interest formula. And you'll remember how compound interest works. It's con the more often it's compounded, the a little bit more money you are making with compound interest. And we talked about how you could compound, you know, once a month. Or you could compound, you know, quarterly, which would be just four times a year or once a month. You could even compound every two weeks. You could even compound every day, 365 times. But what if you wanted to compound more than that? What if more than just every day? What if you wanted to com compound every hour of every day? Well, that's 365 days times 24 hours, All right? So that's getting to be a pretty big number. Let's see. 365 times 24, that's 8,760 times a year. But what if I wanted to do it every minute of every hour of every day? And what if I wanted to do it every second of every minute of every hour of every day? Well, now I'm like starting to compound real often, like, you know, this often, compound, 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 compound. What if I wanted to do it more often than that? What if I wanted to do it every tenth of a second? What if I want to do it every hundredth of a second? You know, we get to the point I can't snap that fast. Okay, so that means we're just constantly compounding. We get to this point to where we are what we call continuously compounding the interest, which means it's just happening constantly. 
It's continuously, constantly, interest is compounding. This is the best possible outcome for us as people who are investing our money. We would love to have interest always being continuously compounded. So if you're ever looking for an investment um, vehicle, an investment opportunity where you're looking to earn interest, you know, you want compounded interest, but the very best type would be continuously compounded interest. This is the one that will yield you the greatest um, results. So there is a formula here and it's easier than the normal, the regular compound interest formula. This is the formula right here. A equals P times E to the power of RT. I call it the PERT formula, P-E-R-T. That's how I remember it. It's my little mnemonic device that I use to remember it. Oh, that's the compound, uh, continuously compound interest formula. That's the PERT. And, you know, I get, I perk up. So kind of like perk, but PERT. It's the PERT, the uh, formula. It used to be a shampoo back when I was a kid called PERT. And I always think of that now when I see it, it had green in it, a green bottle. So I always perk makes me think, oh, the green bottle, that's the continuously compounded interest formula. P is your principal. That's the amount you start with. Of course, E, we know E now, that's Euler's number. That's the natural base E. So that's a constant. That's not a variable. That number is set. And then the exponent R times T, R is the rate. Now, again, as with other situations, the rate might be given to us as a percentage, but we're going to have to change it, move the decimal point over two places and change it to a decimal. And then T, of course, is the time. Now, in this case, the time is always counted in years. So it's how many years, okay? So principal and then the interest rate as a decimal and then the time in years. And that's how you use the formula. You're going to want to use a calculator to, to do these calculations. So, you know, when you're doing your work on your paper, set it up, put all the numbers in place on your paper, and then you can do the calculation on a calculator and then show us uh, the calculation that's derived from that. So this is not something I would expect you to work out by hand. E is an irrational number. Calculators are great for this kind of number crunching. And then you're using, you know, uh, decimals uh, with your in your exponents. This is definitely something where the calculator shines, and it's what is what a calculator was um, invented to do. So I'm not going to go through the last example, example three in your book. You can look at that. Knowing this, this is your formula. Use your principal. Change your rate up there to a uh, a decimal from a percentage to a decimal. Put in the number of years and do the calculation. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a great day and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.